Dartmouth University. It talks about difuntos and specific covers. So, thank you very much for inviting. My thanks to organizers, to Walter Ernesto, for inviting me here and giving me a chance to give this talk and to enjoy this fantastic conference. My thanks to everybody who's going to try and listen to this talk, even though it's the end of the day and everybody's tired. So last year in Los Cabos, I've told, uh, I've gave a talk on a sort of on a big picture of what we were trying to do, which which had a sort of big picture, a conjecture, and not much else. This is a very small piece of that big picture, but. Um, so this is all joint work with Rina Anno of uh, University of, of Kansas State University at the moment. So usually when I give talk, when I give talks about spherical functors or p-functors, I would start with the definition of what a spherical functor or p-functor is, and then I would usually run out of time before I get to any examples, leave alone my own results. So I decided to run this talk in the opposite direction. So first I'll give an example, without telling you what a p-functor is, I will give you an example. It. So I'll start by just playing around with geometry of a cyclic cover. And then hopefully in the end I can just say that the big result is that the stuff in the first half of the talk is what's called a non-split p-functor. So let's sort of uh, look at, a, at cyclic covers. So suppose we have two smooth projective varieties over a field, we, we'll, we secretly think of it as complex numbers. And suppose we have a cyclic n to one cover of called pi of x by z, which is ramified in the divisor. So there is the ramification locus, there is a sort of divisor upstairs. And we also, since it's a cyclic cover, we have an automorphism, uh, we have an automorphism of um, z, sorry, this was meant to be z, which cyclically permutes the branches of the cover. So what this means in a sort of in concrete terms is that downstairs on x, there is essentially an nth root, uh, n plus first root of d. So there is a line bundle on x such that its n plus first power is the line bundle of d. If you, uh, the pullback of L to z is precisely the, the line bundle of E. And lastly, if we take the direct image of the structure shift of z on x, what you get, and that's an OX algebra, and well, what you get is direct sum of OX, L minus one, L minus two, and so on, up to L minus N. And this is an isomorphism of OX algebras. I mean, for, for this to sort of make sense, I should tell you what OX algebra structure here is. Well, it's given by no, noting that L to the power of minus N plus one is O of X minus D, which inserts canonically into OX. So I just multiply these, uh, these together, and uh, any time I get any, any negative power which is higher than n plus one, I just use this embedding. So why do I take negative powers here? Because secretly I'm interested in, uh, in sort of, um, uh, in working um, with uh, a right adjoint of pi lower star. And so, so this is sort of, this will look a little bit unnatural, but it will be clear why do I want negative powers here later on. So of course, if you, I mean, this whole setup can be completely recovered from, uh, from the line bundle. I mean, if, if Miles Reed was in the audience, he would say that n plus one uh, to one cyclic cover is such line bundle, is a variety x with such a line bundle in it. We can just form z as a, as a spec of this OX algebra. Right, so, so suppose we have a setup like this. What I want to look at is two adjunction monads. I mean, we have functor pi lower, pi lower star, which, uh, and pi upper star. So direct image is a functor which goes from dz to dx, and the sort of the pullback, p upper star functor, which goes back. So there, uh, this is the left adjoint of pi lower star. So I want to look at these two guys. Uh, the, the, uh, both of them have a monad, monad structure, well, monad and co-monad structure coming from a junction. So this one is, is easy. I mean, if I look at it, then 
the projection formula immediately tells me that that's just the functor of tensoring with direct image of OZ, and that by uh, assumption is just the sum of uh, OX and negative powers of L. So what I, would what I wanted to think of it as, as that this functor, pi lower star, pi upper star, is a direct sum of n plus one auto equivalences. Moreover, uh, it's sort of, uh, it's not just any auto equivalence, it's essentially uh, powers of the same auto equivalence L minus one. So, on the other hand, if we look at the functor going in other direction, so now instead of, uh, instead of pulling back um, uh, from Z to X and pushing down, we are first pushing down and then, uh, and then pulling back. Now, this is best described in terms of a Fourier Mukai um, kernel, which is the object in the derived category of Z cross Z, which defines this as a Fourier Mukai transform from Z to Z. I mean, and this Fourier Mukai kernel is just the um, fiber product of Z with itself over X. This is because. This is a sort of Tor independent square. This maps a flat. So uh, to go downstairs and then upstairs is the same as to go upstairs and then downstairs. And the, fact that, and the functor of pulling back to fiber product and then pushing down is precisely the Fourier Mukai kernel defined by that fiber product. Now, so what is the geometry of this guy? Well, it's a union, it's a union of n plus one irreducible components. I mean, uh, I think of them as gamma identity, gamma sigma, blah, 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 gamma sigma n, where gamma sigma k is isomorphic, I mean, each of these guys is isomorphic to z. And each of them is just the graph of the kth power of the branch permuting automorphism. So I think of them as, we think of them as twisted diagonals. I mean, this is a real diagonal, and these are sort of, these diagonals shifted by uh, um, the, branch, uh, the c, uh, sigma acting on one of the components. So in particular, they all intersect each other along the ramification divisor. So there is, uh, there is this divisor E which sits inside each of this sort of copy of Z and uh, they all intersect in it. So in particular, this, for, this for this functor to split as a direct sum of auto equivalences, it would essentially mean that E is zero, which means on, uh, only uh, on an, un, on an unramified cover, would this split into a direct sum? Uh, but, however, we cannot, uh, we're not quite lucky, this is not a, a direct sum of sort of, of anything in particular, not a direct sum of auto equivalences, it doesn't have this nice form. But if we look closer at it, now this picture is sort of really important. This intersection of N, uh, copies of Z all intersecting in a divisor because essentially, I mean, I don't have time uh, and it's too, too early on that project to sort of to talk about it in detail, but this is roughly exactly what a stratified topological space looks like, uh, we, uh, which defines, uh, which gives a sort of definition of, of a P functor as a perverse Schober. So this is a, uh, essentially you have a, you, you have an, uh, C complex numbers, uh, which is sort of uh, uh, n plus one to one cover of itself, and then you take and then you, uh, you take the orbifold. So you, you have a topological orbifold, and p functor on that is exactly and perverse Schober on that is a p functor. So it's not at all accidental that it, it, this geometry gives rise to, as we'll see it or later on, to a p functor. Well. If you have a such picture, what happens uh, when you have a, um, a non-irreducible variety consisting of a bunch of components? Well, there's a standard short exact sequence which allows you to break it up into components. If we have the structure shift of, in, of any uh, union of any two uh, varieties can be split up like this. Uh, so if U and V are both components of U, of U union V, then we can sort of split off OV and uh, the kernel of this natural restriction will be just O of U and the ideal sheaf of V restricted to you. So, let, so in our case, we'll use this repeatedly to break this guy up into components. 
So I start with the whole thing, this whole union. Then I, I, I have a natural map from the structure shift of that into the structure shift of everything but this one component. So this tells me that the uh, kernel of this is the structure shift of this one component with the ideal shift of the rest of the components restricted to it. But each of this uh, n minus one remaining components intersects the, this in the divisor E. So the ideal shift is minus n E. We, 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 we get a contribution of n from each of the, um, of the remaining components intersecting it. And then I just repeat this game. I take this guy, I split off, I want to split off of gamma uh, sigma n minus one, the next sort of twist diagonal, the one that goes here. So I take this restriction, and now, since I've uh, split this off already, I've got n minus one components left, which each hit this guy in E. And on it goes, and in the end, I will arrive just to union of uh, normal diagonal and the graph of the first power of sigma. This surjects onto O of diagonal, and uh, then the kernel is just this. So summarizing what happens if we now look at it backwards is that I start with O of, uh, with, the, with the structure for the diagonal and then I take extensions by objects. I mean, this guy, the sort of the first union, is extension of, 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 um, the, of the diagonal by O of gamma sigma minus E then O of gamma sigma squared minus 2e, and so on, until I finally extend it by this. Right, how am I doing for time? Wh when did I start? Sorry? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I mean, people uh, will want to have dinner. But anyways. So um, now, the key thing here is that the structure, I mean, uh, it's a very basic fact. If you've got any map between two varieties, then the functor of the direct image along that map is uh, the fourier mukai uh, transform defined by the graph of that map. So in particular, we've got sigma k, kth power of the branch permuting map from z to z. And O of gamma sigma k is precisely the Fourier Mukai kernel of the direct image along that map. So what that tells us is that O of gamma sigma k twisted by minus k e is the Fourier Mukai kernel of the minus nth power of, of auto equivalence h, which is just uh, I mean h minus one is the uh, <coughs> sigma lower star tensor. Um, uh, o of z uh, minus e. So h is sigma upper star tensor O z e. So what last page tell, told us is that we've got an extension of the Fourier Mukai kernel of identity by the Fourier Mukai kernels of uh, increasing powers of uh, an auto equivalence h to the power of minus one. So the functor we were after, pi lower star, pi upper star, is extension of identity by h minus 1, h minus 2, and so on, all the way to h minus n. So we start with identity, then we've got a, we've got a certain element t in the x1 from O of um, delta to O of gamma sigma minus e, which defines the union of delta and gamma sigma as a sort of, as an extension. And then I extend that by h minus 2 to get the union of the first three components, and so on, until in the end I extend by h minus n, as we saw on the previous page, and I get the union of n plus 1 components, which is the whole thing, the whole, the whole, the whole fiber product. Now, uh, what, what's interesting about this is that if we take these compositions, so if we look as to what this extension looks like just on the h minus 1 component of Q, Q1. You will see that this is the map from h minus 1 to h minus 2, given by first applying t to the, uh, sort of to the right of h minus 1, and then applying t to the left of h minus 1. t, we think of it as a map from h minus 1 to h minus, uh, from identity to h minus 1. And so on, and here we'll have a map from h 
minus n plus 1 to h minus n given by, by essentially applying t to the first to the left of the um, h minus n plus 1 then in between every sort of pair of h's all the way until the end. So we, we have a sum like this. So what this tells us is that in fact another way of saying this is that pi, pi upper star pi lower star is convolution of the functorial complex from identity by t, now t is first x from identity to h minus 1. So it's this degree 0 map from identity to h minus 1 shifted by 1. And then this degree 0 map from h minus 1 shifted by 1 to h minus 2 shifted by 2, and so on. So to say that this is a convolution of this complex is to precisely uh, to say that we've got a repeated extension of this form where we know a little bit more information about each extending map. So let me sort of summarize what happened in this geometrical example. We have a function pi lower star from direct category of z to direct category of x. We've got function of pi upper star going backwards. It's, this is the left adjoint of this. We also have a right adjoint of this, which is what I'm more interested in, uh, simply for, for traditional reasons. The definitions of p functors deal with right adjoints. So here we've got this line bundle L. Here we've got its pullback, which is a line bundle of the divisor E, uh, ramification locus on Z. And we've got uh, a branch permuting automorphism uh, of uh, Z giving us an auto-equivalence uh, sigma upper star. So then pi lower star pi upper star is sum of identity plus L minus 1 and so on to L minus N where L is an auto-equivalence given by tensoring with L. On the second hand, pi, lower star, uh, pi upper star pi lower star is not a sum of uh, n plus 1 auto-equivalence, but it's a repeated extension of identity by n auto-equivalences, where the auto-equivalences uh, permute the branches and twist by the divisor E. Similarly, if, if I now look at pi lower star, pi upper shriek, and pi upper shriek, pi lower star, well, you could just, you could just take an adjoint of this. Now, however, taking adjoints of that is of, of, a, of a sort of, of, of a repeated extension like this is sort of not so easy uh, unless you think of, the, of this in terms of DG. But actually, uh, pi lower star, pi upper shriek is pi upper star tensor relative canonical bundle. There is no shift because Z and X have the same dimension. And the relative canonical bundle is just uh, the line bundle of n copies of E, which is pi upper star uh, of L to the power of n, because pi upper star of L is one copy of E. That means that pi upper shriek is just pi upper star times L uh, composed with nth power of L, or pi upper star composed on the left with n power of H. So if you apply this to this guy, if you sort of apply this to these, you precisely apply L to the power of N to the left of this, or apply H to the power of N to the, sorry, to the right of this, or H to the power of N to the left of this. And you, you will see precisely this complex coming out of it. So the key is that because of, the, because of that geometry, because this sort of the twisted diagonals all intersect, we no longer have a direct sum, but the convolution, which, is, which sort of keeps track of the intersection theory involved. So now on to the p functors. So what is that? Why sort of? Why do I keep going on about pn functors? Well, in brief, the story started with pn objects. I can't. Uh, I cannot not mention them because they are the sort of the mere symmetric origins of this story. So the original definition was by uh, by Daniel Hybrex and Richard Thomas in 2006. They said that if you've got a smooth projective manifold over C, necessarily of even dimension, as will be evident in, in a moment, then an object in a derived category of X is a PN object. Firstly, if its self ring of self X is isomorphic to H upper star of, uh, to the cohomology ring of PN, so quite natural thing for something called PN object to have. Now, and this is isomorphic as graded rings. Now, cohomology, star, uh, cohomology ring of PN, of course, is C0, 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 and the ring structure just tells you that this is a polynomial ring in one variable factor h to the power of n plus 1, where the variable h has degree 2. 
hence C0, C0, and so on. Now, this H, the generator of the X2 uh, from E to E, will be important in, in, a, in a second. And then the second condition is that tensor in E by canonical bundle uh, does nothing. This became known as later on as an adjoints condition, because this tells you something about uh, the sort of the right and left adjoint to the um, functor defined by E as the sort of Fourier Mukai transform from point to X. But uh, so these guys, PN objects, they were introduced as mirror symmetric analogs of honest Lagrangian complex projective spaces <coughs> in a sort of in a Calabiao manifold. So it's the same thing as with um, Lagrangian spheres and spherical objects. The sort of the self acts on uh, holomorphic side correspond to sort of uh, self lower cohomologies. And it's not generally true that they're the same as ordinary cohomologies, but for Lagrangian spheres and Lagrangian CPNs, this is true. So any object which under mere symmetry uh, corresponds to uh, a, a Lagrangian CPN has to have this proper, th these properties. Now, just like with spherical objects, for these guys, for these mirror, mirror symmetry sort of uh, CPNs, there is an analog. If you've got a, a sort of a Lagrangian CPN, you can define a dent twist, the dent twist around it. This is in Paul Zeidel's thesis, I believe. So uh, we can do this purely on the holomorphic side by defining the p-twist to be the endofunctor of the derived category of X, which is defined by the unique convolution of the following three-step complex. I'll explain why it is unique at the moment. But this is sort of, this is E dual box times E, so all of this is happening on X cross X. And, every, and then we have a morphism into the diagonal, which is just a trace morphism. I mean, any morphism into, a di into the diagonal by junction is a morphism from restriction of that onto diagonal. And the moment you restrict this onto diagonal, you've got E dual tensor E, and there is a standard trace morphism into structure shift. Now, this is slightly trickier. We have this object H, which was uh, the generator of the X2 from E to E. So it therefore defines me a map from E shift minus 2 to E. And I apply this map H here and take the difference between that and applying the dual of this map to give me a map from E check shifted by minus 2 to E check. So I take the difference between these two maps defined by this X from here to here. Now, a convolution as before means that, what, I mean, to compute the convolution, we reverse the process we've seen already. We take a cone here and then lift this map to some map from the cone into this and take another cone. Or we can compute it via this. A priori, uh, a sort of a complex, in the, a complex of objects in the derived category has many convolutions, or it might have no convolutions at all. Here, however, the convolution is unique because, luckily enough, the minus first x from this object to this object, x minus 1 from this to O delta. I mean, let's look at this. Uh, shift minus 2 gives me x1, and then I have e check box times e into O of delta, which by a junction and sort of by two adjunctions just gives me x1 from e to e. And, and e was meant to be p an object, so it's self x like a homology of projective space, so the first one is zero. Now, in any three step complex where there are no x minus first x from here to here, the convolution is unique. And uh, if you take any cone, a cone here, then there will be unique lift of this map into this. Or if you take a cone here, there will be unique lift of this map into this. So this is the best possible situation. It almost never happens. However, this was the case. And then they, shown, they, they showed that the functor which you obtain by taking this sort of double cone of this complex is not equivalent of dx. And, under, in, and in the mirror symmetry situation where E really is a, a, mirror, uh, a sort of an image of a Lagrangian CPM, this uh, p-twist really is the image of the, of the corresponding dent twist. So then people have started to think about how to generalize this. So the next sort of step is the story of split p functors, which is why I was going on so, so much about the difference between uh, sort of a direct sum and a convolution. Because 
Cautis, Sabin Cautis and Nick Addington separately around about 2011 defined uh, something they called PN functor. However, the moment we looked at their definition, we told them that this is not the right definition, the defi the, the, that what they're defining is something that should be called split PN functors. Let me explain why. They, the setting is a pair of smooth projective manifolds. And a PN functor from the derived category of Z to the derived category of X is a Fourier Mukai functor F with left and right adjoints, which are also Fourier Mukai transforms, such that there exists a not equivalence H of DZ, such that the adjunction sort of monad RF is isomorphic to the direct sum of identity and uh, powers of H. So the moment we saw this, we said this is a split PN functor, because in case of a spherical functor, is a functor where RF is some non-trivial extension of identity by one copy of quota equivalence. A spherical functor is a sort of certain, uh, well, a P1 functor is a spherical functor in particular. But, uh, so, um, but still, this was a very useful and a very important sort of idea. And this tells you that this is an analog of demanding self acts from E to E of being isomorphic as, as a vector space to cohomology ring of CN. This, then you have to impose an extra condition called monad condition, which is an equivalent of, uh, of self acts being isomorphic to cohomology ring of PN as graded rings. And this condition says the following. This has a natural monad structure, the adjunction monad. If you, if you take a composition of RF with itself, you get RF, RF, and then you can collapse FR in the middle using the adjunction co-unit. So this, the monad structure on this induces the monad structure on this. And I look at the part of the monad structure here, which is multiplication by H. So this gives me a map from, the, mo the monad structure gives me a map from here to here. And this map has to be an upper triangular matrix with identities down the diagonal and stuff here, which we, sort of, which we don't care what it is. So this uh, is uh, sort of an equivalent of, the, of, the, of demanding uh, a graded ring isomorphism. And the last condition is the adjoint condition. It tells you that the nth power of H is precisely the difference between right and left adjoint, which is why I sort of mentioned uh, that E tensor canonical shift is E, is, is, that's, that's precisely this. So in this setting, you then can define the p-twist to be a certain convolution of this complex, where the map, where we take composition of F with its right adjoint. So this is an doing right adjoint and then F, F itself. Then we take a junction co-unit into, into the identity functor. That's the first map, first part of this complex. Second part of this complex is obtained as follows. Consider the map from FR, FR to FR, which is, uh, up, which is uh, defined by first applying a junction co-unit to this, and then applying a junction co-unit to this, and then taking the difference. Well, in the middle here sits RF, which we know to be isomorphic to direct sum of identity and powers of H. In particular, it has this component H here. And therefore, this is FHNR plus FHN minus 1R plus F blah blah plus FHR plus FR. And now I want a map from FHR to FR, which is the component of this map under identification of this with this. So I want this comp component going from here to here. So Addington, uh, Nick Addington noted that there is no longer a unique Postnikov system associated to this. Uh, X, you know, X minus first X from here to here is no longer zero, and he provided a certain canonical choice of how, of, you know, you take a cone here, and then he, he said that there exists a, uni a sort of a canonical lift of the trace map to a map here, which computes this, and he called it P-twist. This caused no end of technical difficulties. Uh, uh, some, a story which I don't have time to tell you is that we have a paper out sort of two weeks ago which shows that in fact this, even though there are different Postnikov systems which, which can compute the convolution of this, the convolution of this complex is unique. 
for any sort of, in a, in a much more general setting uh, related to a junction. Uh, whatever cone you take, whatever lift you take, the result will always be isomorphic. So these days, after this, pay, after this new paper, a P twist should be defined as the unique convolution of this complex. But um, well, is, as long look, um, yeah. So what I'm telling is that P twist is defined up to an isomorphism. So is everything in derived category. No, but if you want to play with this you need to uh, Well, in the, oh, look, look, look. The real definition is in, the, is in DG categories, and there I can give you sort of uh, there we have full control. But the, but anyway. So now the last part of it is sort of is non-split P functors. I'm sorry, this is the last slide, and I didn't have time to break it up into pieces. But the idea is that, uh, I mean, we work in, we, we use sort of DG enhancements, so we, we don't need to work with direct categories of smooth projected varieties and four Mukai functors. We can work with any triangulated categories which have some enhancements. <coughs> and then a PN functor is, a, is an exact functor from A to B, which have left and right adjoints from B to A, such that they're all DG enhanceable. So they, they, they all come from some quasi functors uh, between the sort of the clusters of these guys in the homotopy category of DG categories. Ba basically, there is a DG structure which gives rise to all of these. Then instead of asking for RF to be a direct sum of identity and powers of H, we ask for RF to be isomorphic to QN, where QN is a repeated extension. We extend identity by H uh, via any first X, then we extend uh, the result by H2 using any extension, such that its projection onto the, compo onto the H sitting in here is SH minus HS. I, I take H squared and first apply S to go to H on the right, then on the left. And I repeat this, I repeat this, I repeat this until I extend uh, the QN minus 1 by HN here, and I get object QN. Notice that object QN has object QN minus 1 sort of... Uh, sitting inside it, and we've got a projection onto HN. So now the monad condition we, is a significant weakening of uh, what Nick Addington proposed, because we are asking for a certain composition of maps to be an isomorphism. If you apply this in a split setting, you will get precisely the map which Nick Addington asked to be an upper triangular matrix with identities down, down, down the diagonal. We just ask it to be invertible. We don't so, uh, which gives you a lot more sort of freedom. And then the adjoints condition is the same. A certain natural map from R to H and L is an isomorphism. So R differs from L by H M. And the sort of the result and the reason for the first part of the talk being there is that in the setting of this cyclic n plus one to one covers, pi upper star composed uh, with its right adjoint is a direct sum of uh, autoequivalences. So pi upper star is a PN functor, it's a split PN functor. However, pi lower star is composed with its right adjoint is a, convol a convolution of exactly the right kind uh, of identity and, uh, auto of, and powers of autoequivalence auto H. So pi lower star, the functor of direct image down a cyclic uh, n, to n plus 1 to 1 cover, is a non-split PN functor, the first sort of example uh, that we know. And somehow, now that we got a better idea of where the PN functors come from, it's not surprising that, this, that, this, uh, that, that basically that this geometry gave, handed us this geometry, handed us the first example of a non-split PN functor. So I'd like to stop here.